make an appointment. Consultation is just a consultation. It's a non-binding appointment. So I really always encourage people to get the information because it does frustrate me when people reach out to me and say, I wish I made that appointment. I wish I had met you sooner. I wish I had seen a radiation oncologist. Hey everyone, welcome back to the vlog. So this is part two and we are continuing our conversation on nasal tumors in dogs and kitty cats. I will put a link below so you can get up to speed and catch up on the different tumors that we see, who gets it, and some of the different symptoms that we might be seeing in pets that have cancer. And um, we're gonna dive in and start talking about test, treatment, and prognosis. Let's do it. Of course, uh, you know, for all of our patients, we are going to want to do some basic blood work and your analysis. If your pet is having a nosebleed, what we call epistaxis, your veterinarian is probably going to do some extra tests just to make sure that they're not having something called coagulopathy, a bleeding disorder. So they may run some tests coagulation test to check for that as well, including checking the platelets because the platelets help the blood clot. They may also check blood pressure because high blood pressure can uh, cause nosebleeds as well. So they're going to do a full workup to rule out, as we say, some of the other things that can cause nosebleeds. There are other nasal cancers, fungal disease, um, and non-cancerous processes that can cause nose disease as well. So a lot of these cases will, um, in my practice, would get worked up by an internist, often my husband. So not all pets that have nasal symptoms will end up with a diagnosis of cancer. And that's an important thing to mention. But what's going to be really important is getting a piece of tissue and some imaging of what's going on inside the nasal cavity. And skull x-rays or radiographs are just really not a very good test. Um, they're not very sensitive or specific. So really, and they need to be done under, you know, anesthesia anyway. So if they're recommended, I would highly encourage you not to have them done. And a CT scan is really, or an MRI is going to be the best way to look in that nasal cavity. One of the reasons that we medical and radiation oncologists prefer a CT scan over an MRI is that can be used for radiation planning. So typically our internist would do a CT scan and then if based on the CT scan determined he needed a biopsy, we do rhinoscopy, which is a scoping procedure uh, where he uses a fiber optic camera or he or she to get a piece of tissue and that allows us to get a diagnosis. So, and then we're gonna use, you know, get a biopsy report that's gonna tell us if it's cancer and then the type of cancer. And go back to part one, I talked about the different cancers that we see in both dogs and cats. A few other staging tests. Staging means tests to look for spread that we are going to want to do for once we've confirmed it's cancer is I usually will aspirate these lymph nodes, the mandibular lymph nodes, to see if it's spread to the mandibular lymph nodes. On the CT scan, we'll be able to evaluate some of the deeper lymph nodes that we can't see. They're called the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. I recommend looking at the chest. So if you're doing a CT, we would often scan the chest with the CT as well when we're doing the, the head and neck area. Uh, chest radiographs are another option. And I do have another YouTube video comparing and contrasting uh, chest x-rays to a CT, but in my opinion, if you're doing a CT of the head and neck area, just go ahead and CT the lungs to look for metastasis. As for an abdominal ultrasound, usually most of these nasal cancers in dogs don't go to the lung to the abdomen, to the abdominal organs. But in my opinion, if you're about to embark on a journey where you're considering radiation therapy, which is quite expensive, I do recommend doing an abdominal ultrasound or some other imaging just to make sure that there's nothing else there that we should know about from a general health screening standpoint, like a splenic mass. I had a, one pet where we, a cat that we found bladder cancer. Uh, it was a cat with an oral tumor. So I just like to know, you know, where, what, everything that could possibly be there before we're doing thousands and thousands of dollars of radiation. So an abdominal ultrasound is not really needed for most dogs with nasal cancer, but I still think, you know, a couple hundred dollars for an abdominal ultrasound is a reasonable test to do. For cats with nasal cancer, we talked about that lymphoma is the most common cancer that we see. So definitely an abdominal ultrasound to look at the liver and the spleen and the GI tract is recommended in my opinion. 
So let's talk about treatment because there's a range of treatment options and we'll talk about definitive uh, treatment options, which is sort of the best chance for long-term survival and then some more palliative options where you're trying to improve the quality of life. We're always trying to improve the quality of life, but you're not treating as aggressively, just trying to alleviate some of the symptoms and make the pet more comfortable. So these are cases where I think it's, it's helpful to talk to a radiation oncologist specifically because that is the treatment of choice for most of these nasal cancers, especially dogs. Um, and we'll put links. Uh, radiation is even harder than sometimes to find than a medical oncologist or radiation oncologist. Uh, but we'll put some links so you can try to find one near you or you can talk to your veterinarian or talk to a medical oncologist because uh, at least we can present the different options for you and hopefully help you find someone in your area. So as I mentioned, radiation is the treatment of choice and I do have a good amount of experience. So I was out of practice for about eight years where we had stereotactic radiation, which is one of these advanced forms of, of radiation. And nasal tumors was the second most common cancer that we treated with stereotactic radiation right after brain cancer, um, brain tumors, because it was a very precise form of radiation. So it really focused on the tumor with not allowed a lot of radiation to the tissues surrounding the tumor. And if we think about the nasal cavity, there's a lot of critical structures near the nose, the mouth and the gums and the mucous membranes that line the mouth and the eyes and things like that. And over the years, as we've shifted towards stereotactic radiation, we really have been able to decrease the number of radiation treatments for nasal cancers by treating with stereotactic radiation and decrease the side effects. So that is really, in my opinion, the treatment of choice for dogs with nasal cancer is going to be stereotactic radiation. When we first started stereotactic radiation, I think in about 2009, we were one of two facilities in the U.S. who were doing it. It was us in New York and Colorado State. Now, fast forward, you know, 11 years, there's many more radiation facilities, you know, that are offering stereotactic radiation. So you don't have to come to New York or Colorado to get that. So that's really great news for pets. Uh, but I did have people come from, uh, we had one cat come from Hong Kong and we had, uh, I had people drive up from Florida and Texas. Uh, people come in from Canada and um, New Jersey, which isn't that far but Massachusetts and DC and things like that. So, you know, people really trekked quite far for radiation, but um, again, it's not that hard to get radi uh, stereotactic radiation, but the reason that people drove for it, because there's other radiation facilities, is that this allows for nasal cancer to treat usually with three treatments was what we were treating with. So on, on a couple of consecutive days, with a lot less side effects. Um, so they didn't get a lot of the burning and the mucositis or the inflammation of the tissues in the area. And so the reason I kind of go into that is a lot of people are scared of radiation. Traditional radiation was often 15 to 20 treatments and in dogs and cats, it does require anesthesia. So I think it's just important to realize that things are constantly evolving. I haven't been doing stereotactic radiation directly. I'm at a different practice now. so. I want you to go talk to a radiation oncologist. And what's really important is if you're considering it is to do it sooner rather than later, um, because we know that you know getting that treatment on early is gonna be better than waiting a month or two and just seeing how things progress. So, and things are constantly changing. Protocols, technology, things are improving. So if you're thinking about it, I want you to get more information and I hope this video is giving you a little bit of hope and encouragement to do that. There's a second type of radiation called palliative radiation where you're still giving small numbers of treatments, so maybe usually three or four treatments, uh, often on a weekly basis, but it's not giving, it's not delivering the same high dose of radiation uh, and it's more for comfort, so maybe just to shrink the tumor, you're not going to get the same long-term benefits that we'll talk about when we talk about prognosis. But again, I want everybody to know that there's different ranges of options. Um, there 
you know, there's no treatment, obviously, which is okay, and maybe just some pain medications and appetite support, and there's palliative radiation, and then there's going to be uh, what's usually called external beam radiation, and I would recommend stereotactic radiation for these dogs with nasal tumors. Uh, and so, you know, there are a range of options. So in general, radiation is going to be better, much better than surgery. So surgery is pretty invasive. The problem with surgery is you, it, these are malignant cancers. And if you watched some of my other videos, we know that we need to remove tumors with margins and you can't just get margins without removing the nose. So these tumors grow back pretty quickly with surgery. Um, and if you debulk the nose tumor, you're still going to have to do radiation anyway. So we don't in general recommend surgery for dogs with malignant nose tumors. There was a study where they did surgery after radiation. And in that small study, if I remember correctly, the dogs did live four years, but there was an increased uh, side effects in those dogs um, and obviously increased cost as well. So it may be something you want to talk about with your radiation oncologist and a surgeon and your medical oncologist as a possibility. But in general, surgery is not the treatment of choice. Radiation is going to be. Um, chemotherapy, again, this is a solid tumor in the nasal cavity. Unless you have a cat with lymphoma or a dog, a rare dog with nasal lymphoma, in general, chemotherapy is not going to have much of an impact on a dog with uh, nasal um, cancer, so the adenocarcinomas, chondrosarcomas. Uh, sometimes it can be tried palliative just to try to shrink the tumor a little, improve airflow, uh, improve the quality of life. So maybe if you're in a part of the country where um, radiation is not available or the cost is, you know, too far or too far, the cost is too far, the cost is just not, um, you know, within your financial budget, that might be something to talk about. Uh, but again, usually going to be palliative um, just to try to shrink the tumor a little. Um, I have used off-label palladia in some cases as well and have seen some effect in some cases. So it's something to talk to your veterinarian or your oncologist about as well. But again, going back, just, you know, radiation is going to be the treatment of choice. One of the things that's really important about radiation, you know, when you go to surgery and your dog has its tumor removed, it's removed out of it. So, you know, if they have mammary cancer, breast cancer, it's when they come home, the cancer is gone. With radiation, we are damaging the DNA of these cancer cells. And it's not until those cancer cells try to divide that the cell then dies. And so the take home message is a lot of these tumors will have a slow regression, especially if they're slowly dividing tumors. And so we did a lot of repeat CT scans in our um, our unit was called CyberKnife. Our CyberKnife patients, um, we usually recommended at least, least a six month CT scan if the owners could, um, and then uh, every six months. And some of our clients would let us do them every three months. And it was really interesting to see these tumors slowly progress. And sometimes there was minimal change just visually at, on the CT scan at three months, but then at six months and then at nine months. So it can be very slow regression of these tumors. And sometimes the tumor wouldn't go into a complete remission until one year. So, you know, it just to remind you that these doesn't zap and melt the tumor and on the next CT, you can still have visible mass. But what it doesn't tell us is whether those cancer cells are alive or dead when we see mass in the nose on the CT scan. I hope that makes sense. Uh, but it's a slow regression, but it still works. Um, but it's just a little bit different than when your pet's tumor is removed surgically. Another thing with radiation, um, side effects usually are not immediate. So if they're going to occur, they usually occur about two to three weeks after radiation, and they can last a couple of weeks after that. Um, and those are called the acute side effects. And then sometimes they can have late side effects that can occur six to 12 months after. And so if you're considering radiation, your radiation oncologist, depending on what is included in the field, is the tumor extending back into the brain? The side effects really will depend on where the tumor is. Is it on one side of the nasal cavity? Is it, is it eating into the palate, which is the bone that separates the mouth? If it is, they could have, you know, a fistula, which is a hole between 
the nose. So that CT scan before that before radiation planning is going to give us a good idea of what the extent of it is, what the potential side effects are, and how big the tumor is. Because like I said, you can have a dog that looks, and a cat that looks really normal. We really need that CT scan to figure out what the tumor is doing internally. Is it going in, into the sinus, et cetera? So again, once your pet has a CT scan, you'll get more information about what potential acute early side effects you may see, and then the late side effects after radiation. All right, doc, how's my dog gonna do? Always the question that we get. And so just remember, maybe if you haven't watched any of my videos, is that there's always gonna be ranges with numbers. So there will be pets that do better and pets that do worse. Uh, and we do our best to make predictions, but these are just generalizations. Uh, obviously, please talk to a specialist yourself. And But again, just, you know, that's my disclaimer with these numbers. In general, uh, for dogs um, and cats with nasal cancer not treated, it's usually about three months. Um, it's usually they're gonna succumb to the local disease. When these cancers do metastasize, it's usually later in the course of disease. So usually it's a quality of life issue from the tumor, um, you know, affecting the different structures in their face and just causing a deterioration in their quality of life. With dogs treated with radiation, on average, for about for the most common one, adenocarcinomas, it's usually about a year. A year, that's, that's, not a, that's not a lot of time, Dr. Sue. Again, let's put that into perspective with the dog's life. And so a year for a dog is like meet five. I know when it's your pet, it's never long enough. I get that because I've had pets with cancer and other diseases, so I absolutely get that. But a year of quality of life is pretty good. Um, it's not horrible, especially considering some of the other cancers that I treat. So, and that's just the median. There are dogs that live longer, and I've had dogs that I've treated with nasal cancer that are out with adenocarcinomas that are out three and four years. Some of the cancers will do better. So chondrosarcoma is one that has a better reported prognosis. And then some of them are shorter. So some of the squamous cell carcinomas can do worse, uh, especially there may be other more specific information on your pet's biopsy that may help your oncologist give you a better prognosis. So the grade, poorly differentiated, did it spread to the lymph nodes, other concurrent things going on with your pet. So again, these are just really broad generalizations. Please, I encourage you to see a specialist, have them examine your pet or have your veterinarian um, consult with a specialist. So I'm now doing that through um, Fidu Vet. I'll put a link below as well. So, but again, it's really important that those recommendations are based on your pet and their biopsies and, and more specific information. But this is just to give you a ballpark and I hope that that is helping. With palliative radiation, often about half a, half a year, about six to seven months. Again, depends on some of the other things that we talked about. Palliative chemo can be about the same, about five to seven months. So again, it's just to really make them more comfortable, hopefully shrink the tumor. Um, and then palliative medical management, so pain management, appetite stimulants, usually gonna be a little bit shorter than that, usually about three to four months. But again, there'll be variations on, on all of that. What about kitty cats? So for the non-lymphoma kitties, similar to dogs, so usually those kitty cats with the adenocarcinomas that are treated with radiation about, uh, about a year, so three months versus a year. Lymphoma is, a, you'll get a, a little bit of variation with that. So um, for the kitty cats that are treated with radiation, you'll see variations depending on what source, but about, you know, 18 months, a year, which is a year and a half to two years. And if they have a complete response, you know, some of the papers will report that three years. Um, the question that we often have is, do the kitties need chemotherapy? Because often they will progress systemically to those other common sites that we see lymphoma. So liver, spleen, lymph nodes, and things like that. So I typically do recommend chemotherapy um, for in conjunction with um, the radiation as well. A common theme with cats, even like very similar if you watched my GI lymphoma, is getting them into a complete remission. Cats that have a partial response or don't respond, you know, their survival times are usually very short, less than six months, often about four months. So really important that we're getting them into a complete remission. 
What if you can't do radiation because of the cost or you know things like that? I will treat them with chemotherapy um, and survival times range anywhere from six months to a year and I've had some do better than that. Um, I always you know, like to give some examples and I'm sure um, Miku's mom is watching, so Robin is watching. So Miku was one of the first cats that I treated with the CyberKnife stereotactic radiation at the other facility that I was talking about. It was a nasal lymphoma kitty. We did six months of CHOP chemotherapy and Miku is now out, I think over seven and a half years and has yet to relapse. I just knocked on wood with her lymphoma. So, you know, great example. One of the nice things about the lymphoma, you know, is it a lot, it spares the eyes. They don't get cataracts and things like that. So, um, you know, a great, great, um, you know, example. And I, I told Miku's mom that I was hopeful, you know, she had a complete response, you know, two or three years. And so here we are way doubled that. So, you know, great. I love when I'm wrong. I always hope that I'm wrong when it's to the patient's advantage. And then finally, cats like dogs that are treated palliatively, usually just a couple of months, I'd say about three or four months. And again, I find that cats are more sensitive to stuff, to anything in their nose, whether it's just an upper respiratory infection or a nasal tumor. So appetite support, you know, there's Miritaz, which is a topical um, ear transdermal medication. Uh, just so important to make sure that they're eating and monitoring their weight. So again, I'm going to put that link below about um, monitoring for weight loss and different medications that we can do. But I hope this highlights that there is a range of options for these dogs and cats. Uh, you know, radiation is expensive. I didn't give the cost of radiation on purpose because it varies in different parts of the country. I'm in the metro New York area, which is, as many people know, not, not an inexpensive part of the country. And, you know, stereotactic radiation, you know, is over $10,000. Uh, so it's not inexpensive. Um, in different parts of the country, it will range. Palliative radiation can be a couple of thousand dollars, but it's going to vary on the facility that you see. Uh, so again, I encourage you to, you know, make an appointment. Consultation is just a consultation. It's a non-binding appointment. So I really always encourage people to get the information because it does frustrate me when people reach out to me and say, I wish I made that appointment. I wish I had met you sooner. I wish I had seen a radiation oncologist. So please seek out the information. It's always okay to decide not to do something once you've gotten the information. And that wraps up our two-part series on nasal cancer. Remember, if you missed part one, I'll have a link below. Thank you so much for watching. Deanna, this one was for you. Guys, I do read the comments. If you are looking for another video, uh, you know, topic I haven't done, let me know. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the positive feedback. Please don't forget to subscribe and I look forward to seeing you at the next video.